As you can see, the screen is not on. As you can also see, there's no slideshows on Blackboard today. So what's happening today? I'm doing a end-to-end -end session, going from crappy data to normalized to logical diagram or conceptual diagram to physical diagram. And you all get to enjoy my handwriting while I do it. Uh, there will be no slideshow. So, because there isn't needed one, because I'm not covering anything new today. Picture this as a all-encompassing review. So, just for you, I've got one set aside. And it gets harder with every sound effect. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, just because there's no slideshow doesn't mean you get to have a chat. If you want to take notes, yes. All right. So, we are going to start normalizing, and those of you that have already hit this lab have seen something that looks similar to this. That looks like part two of the lab. Sorry guys, at the back I can't make the writing any bigger. Should have gotten here earlier so you could have sat up front with me. But that having been said, this says invoice number, invoice date, supplier number, supplier name, SKU, description, and quantity. The only difference between this and the lab is the fact that there's no um, price column, which will not affect this. I am just got tired of writing. So. Currently, the data, the data is, non, is unnormalized. So if we were going to express this in the UNF, we'd put in number, invoice, date, supplier, number, supplier, name, skew, running out of room, description, and quantity. Man, I didn't want to go to the other board. Okay, this is unnormalized. In other words, there's all kinds of issues. And when we look at this data, we can see that there's a gap here and a gap here. You can picture this as in the monthly report that they run to see what's been ordered. So when we look at this, what is this chunk right here called? It's known as a repeating group. Therefore, this is our repeating group. Now, what's the rule for first normal form? Anybody want to remember? remember and blah, anybody remember and want to shout it out? Pardon? Yes, you cannot have repeating groups and you must have a primary key defined. So, there are two ways of resolving this to first normal form. Option number one is to fill in these chunks, which would just get rid of the repeating group. That's fine. So let's pretend. Actually, I want to stay away from red for this. Okay, now this gets rid of the repeating group by just filling in the data. 
That was option number one. We've gotten rid of the repeating group. However, what have we? Yes. Well, what's happening is this data over here is being repeated because these chunks are unique per row. Originally, it was a repeating group because there was nothing here. Thus, it became a repeating group because there's repeated data with other data missing. Yeah, so the top one would get carried down. So one of the cheap ways, and this is the cheap way to get the first normal form, is to backfill the data all the way down so that you have a complete grid with no white space, if you want to visualize it using a grid. The other thing we have to do is we have to identify our primary keys. And what happens is, right now, we can assume that each invoice only goes to one supplier, but he can buy many things at that supplier. So odds are, invoice number, supplier number, and the SKU is the primary key currently. Or at least you could call them our candidate keys. Because we can use those combined, and actually that's got to go all the way to the end, to identify each row. And now this gets transformed into one and F. So now it's in first normal form. Yes. Skew. Okay. Do you ever buy groceries for yourself? Do you ever buy bananas? Four zero one one. 2020, uh, 2120 is cheesecake cupcakes at Loblaws, just so you know. <laughs> How do I know? I bought some last night for my wife. <laughs> Same thing, to skew. Um, yep, so that's solution number one. Option number two to get rid of the repeating groups, we could uh, put it on this side for now to show you guys which is, I'll call it plan B, would be <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> yeah, you're from Northern Ontario. <laughs> and then order lines. Okay, so the other choice we had, instead of this version of normal, first normal form, this would be the other choice we had, which was This was plan B. So, and now what happens is this is one set of primary keys, and that's the other primary key. That's our plan B. They're both valid, they both work. Um, depending on your background, how you were trained, one or the other, it's your choice. They're both in first normal form. So these are, that's the plan A and plan B of first normal form. By the time we get the second normal form, they'll look exactly the same, which is why there's almost no point. You pick one and you follow it. Now, depending what approach we want to take, and I'm going to go with uh, p 
pick one, I don't care. Um, I'll go with this one here. And the first normal form means there are no repeating groups, everything has a primary key. For a second normal form is number one, you have to be what? You have to be in first normal form and you can have no partial dependencies. Anybody want to shout out what the definition of a partial dependency is? Okay. Uh, it, the, the value depends on part of the primary key. It could depend on two pieces of a three-part primary key, but it depends on only part of the primary key. Therefore, it's known as a partial dependency. And to get the second normal form, we need to get rid of the partial dependencies. And we can achieve that by creating a series of entities to hold them. First one we'd create is orders. I was trying to make a decision in my brain what to do next. Okay, then we need an order lines because of this situation over here, which would have us. which gets broken down like this. And as we work our way through it, we're going to start realizing that there's a few other issues included for the ride. And the one that we're having a problem with right now is this. Because once it's been brought down here, the skew got broken out of the primary key that we decided it was originally which leads us this to have what's the issue we have here now Yes. Yes, we have a transitive dependency where the description is based on the skew, and the skew is controlled by this part of the primary key. So if this value gets is not tied to the primary key anywhere. So to express this in third normal form, yeah. Yes. It has to be in first normal form and there can be no partial dependencies.
And for third normal form, you have to be in second normal form and you can have no transitive dependencies. Which is all in last week's slides in plain English. So what we have to do in the end to break it down to its final stage is we have to explode the order lines so that the description's removed out of it. I think I'm going to have enough room. Oh, it's going to be tight. Actually, just to make life easier, because there's just not enough room vertically. I'm not going to rewrite that chunk. It's not changing. What is changing, though, is It's products and order lines. Products will have a skew and a description. That's the order lines broken down third normal form. So in the end, our entities that we have is orders with invoice number, invoice date, supplier number, suppliers with supplier number, supplier name, products with a SKU and a description, and then order lines which has the invoice number, supplier number, SKU, and quantity. Now, we can improve this marginally just a little because the, because the rules of normal, normalization state certain things. However, you suddenly realize as you go through this process that maybe you're king across too much information. For example, the invoice number and the supplier number uniquely identify this one. And invoice number and supplier number identify this one uniquely. Same thing here. Now, if we suddenly decided that the invoice number, because right now, based on this, we don't know what the source of the invoice number is. Right? We have no idea what the source of the invoice number is. We could, you know, make a decision that this is a surrogate key or it gets generated on the fly. And suddenly, Supplier number is no longer part of the primary key. I'm going to leave it in there because that's how I finished this. Um, but if you decide that the invoice number is a surrogate key, you can get rid of several steps in, not several steps, but in here, this would be carried down to here, as, and then that would be the transitive dependency also. So you'd end up having to do the exact same things. You just had to do it in a different order. And it's because we don't have a business case to go with it. Like, we don't have a paragraph explaining the logic of the data, so we have to make assumptions. Yes? That's a transitive dependency. Description depends on SKU. SKU depends on invoice and supplier number. Yeah, because it's one extra, it's once removed from the primary key. The description is removed from the primary key because the description is based on the skew. After the skew, 
The skew, on the other hand, is tied to the primary key. So this attribute depends on an attribute that is not part of the primary key. This attribute depends on the primary key, which is the definition of a transitive dependency. Okay? Okay, we're going to deal first with the order. And right now, the order is, is built by the supplier number and the invoice number and the invoice date. Each supplier can supply many orders, right? But each order is only ever against one supplier. Right? Theoretically. Odds are you're going to order from a supplier more than once. Most suppliers. Um, that's the supplier to orders. Now, Didn't give myself a lot of room. Like that. Now, because we said that the supplier number is actually part of um, the primary key here, I accidentally erased it earlier, um, it should be in here also as a foreign key that's also part of the primary key that's a foreign key that's participating in the primary key I decided to make it pink That one says products, just so if you're far away and you're trying to read it.
That says description. Now, the products can be included in an order line. That means we need the product ID over here, which realistically, as somebody mentioned earlier, I went and accidentally erased the line. So that's normalization to conceptual. Supplier can have many orders. Yes. Yeah, it should be. Thanks. There we go. Thank you. Supplier can have many orders. The order has an invoice number. Supplier number helps identify it. It has a date. Each order must have at least one order line because as far as we know that's what the data told us and you identify each line by three-way compound key we have a products table that has a SKU and a description it gets fit into here the SKU comes here and then we also have the quantity for the order lines so all that normalization gets represented by this pretty picture this very colorful picture so this is, of course, if you're working with the existing data that's been given to you by someone. That's this. So it goes from this to this in the design process. The next step after this will be converting this from a conceptual to a logical. And then we'll go from logical to physical in just a few minutes. The logical diagram is very similar to a conceptual diagram. And if you read the textbook, you'll see that they talked about two different kinds of notations. One was roughly this kind of notation, which is known as the COD, conceptual notation. And then the other ones is what they called the logical one. The logical one, for people that have worked with databases, starts looking familiar because it has a table-like layout. I left myself lots of room here because I don't want to redraw this a second time. Actually, if I give myself kinds of all kinds of room, I still need to redraw it.
then I'm just going to draw in my relationships. Because we already know what these rules of engagement are, so we don't need to rethink about them. Okay. Conceptual. Logical. There's no new information in the logical than there was in the conceptual. It's just the format is different. However, this is where we start throwing in a few new little rules. That's an extra question for you. Yes. Not null. I was about to explain it. At this stage is when you start deciding what pieces of information are required for the business. We have not yet assigned any data types. Um, but this is when you start deciding what are the bits and pieces that are needed for the business. So you start figuring out your business rules at this point of the game. Okay, so the next step after logical is going to physical. Now, this is where things get a little rough. And I don't have a slide for this, but I explain the concept at this point because I got almost a whole group here. So for those that didn't come today, you get to watch the recording and you don't get to ask any questions. In the world of database, when we get down to the physical side of the deal, there's been a holy war going on for the last 30 years. Holy war about naming conventions. Of all the stupid things that they can fight about, they're all fighting about who's right, about how things are supposed to be named. And there was all kinds of write-ups by the, the big muckety-mucks of database land that were originally based on business requirements of how things were written in the 70s. And back then, when you were designing tables, tables were singular. Your primary keys had an interesting naming convention, and foreign keys had the exact same name as the primary keys from the other table. Now, seven, eight, nine years ago, Yes, now I'm going to say almost nine years. This product came out and it took the world by storm. And the concept behind this product lives on today. The product came in and said, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It was called Ruby on Rails. Now, Ruby on Rails introduced the concept of a framework for developing with what they call an object relation mapping system, an ORM. And everybody looked at that and they said, hot damn, Rails is the coolest thing ever. I'm going to copy that. And then Ruby died. They came up with the greatest thing ever. Lots of applications are written in Ruby on Rails. But when people start out fresh, rarely they pick Ruby as their choice target. It's not supported at all ISPs and stuff like that. So, you know, unless you're very specific companies, it's, you know, it's almost a, no, I wouldn't say it's a dead language, but it's been relegated off to the niche. That's a what language? No, it's not moving anymore. It, it got up the side of the hill, then the sun hit it. Pretty much. And people made escargot out of it. Yeah, but it's basically dead as a doorknob. It's not gaining any more traction. However, the concept behind the Rails framework, on the other hand, caught like wildfire. And there was a little funny thing about this. It took the control of how things were named out of the hands of the database designers and gave it to the developers. Because, you know, they're the ones that actually have to work with the damn stuff. So the Rails guys came up with a set of rules. And the rules for Rails and the rules for CakePHP 
Laravel for PHP, uh, whatever the heck it's called for Python, Django, I think it's called, uh, Struts for Java, and ASP.NET. There's a framework for ASP.NET that does something similar. They came down to the point where all these groups of people have come down to agreeing about almost 98% of their naming conventions, and they're almost the opposite of what the traditional one was. In this class, I use what's called, this is considered a de facto standard. If you don't know what the word de facto means, it means it's a standard that's being generally accepted even though it hasn't been endorsed by an official body like the IEEE or the ISO groups. Basically put, everybody says, this is great. The database is like magic. The framework understands the database without me having to code tons and tons of SQL. It's great if we follow these naming conventions. Now, the naming conventions are as follows, and I'm going to post these on Blackboard for everybody's enjoyment later. But it's pretty straightforward, and some of you have already heard it. Ooh. Wow, that's going to be too small. Everything is lowercase. You do not use case. You don't use camel case. You get take that little habit you're picking up in Java class and ignore it for this class. Let me tell you why. Everything the decision was to make this lowercase. Microsoft SQL Server is case insensitive, depending on what oper on what region it's been installed in. For example. It's installed in North America, it's case insensitive. It gets installed on a server that's running Cyrillic, it's case sensitive. It depends. MySQL is case insensitive unless you turn it on. Postgres is anal retentively case sensitive. It is brutal. Postgres comes back from a really old system called Ingress. And by the way, that's what this genesis here at the school runs on. The student information system is running on an Ingress database that's 20 years old at least. Actually, those of you that have Cheryl as your lab monitor, she worked to develop Genesis here. She worked as a consultant. So she's well informed about how the back end works here at the school. She's just amazed that it still works. Everything is lowercase. Oracle lies. You create a table, even if you do it in mixed case, it stores it in its data dictionary in uppercase. And then a few other servers do things a little differently. However, if you make everything lowercase, it's going to, the structure can be poured from one database to the other without having to worry about its quirks for naming. That's why everything is lowercase. Tables are plural. In other words, it's not product, it's products. It's not student, it's students. Primary keys are called ID, and only ID. This is where you're going to see how this is going to change dramatically when it goes from the logical to the physical. Primary keys are called ID and only ID. Now, historically, if the table was students, the primary key would have been called student underscore ID, or student camel case ID, or student capital ID. The logic would be to always prefix the primary key with the name of the table. Great. Nowadays, it's just called ID. Why? Because the framework expects it to be called ID, and if it just hits it, it goes pow, it works. Congratulations. It's ID. Foreign keys. This is the one that kills everyone.
The foreign key is named the singular parent table. That's an underscore. That's totally unlegible for the values at the back. And then the name of the primary key from the parent table. So you'll see it in action in a few minutes. In other words, if a table was called orders, the key would be called order underscore ID. Why is it called under order underscore ID? Because it's the ID of an order, which is found in the orders table. The ORM is able to figure out this magic on its own without you having to code it in, because you follow these rules. No spaces. Why? When you start learning SQL, you'll discover SQL uses spaces to separate its commands. Therefore, if you put a space in the table name, it thinks you're talking about two different things. What do you use instead? An underscore. Why do you use an underscore instead of a dash? Because a dash is a mathematical operator and the database servers understand, and database servers understand math. So instead of saying person underscore ID, if you did person dash ID, go person minus ID. Same thing as losing your wallet. If you use a dash, it subtracts one from the other. Neither of them exists, so what do you get? You get an error message. One rule, two rules, three rules, four rules, five rules. Okay? Now that you've been given your rules, easy what? Easy peasy. I guarantee 40% of you are going to lose marks on your first assignment because of this. This summer it was 52% of the group. Why? Because they can't listen to Dan. Because they're busy texting and playing Call of Duty or whatever the heck it is right now. Overwatch. It used to be League of Legends. Thankfully that's almost dead now, at least in the classroom. These are the rules. They'll be posted on Blackboard. On the assignment, when I hand out the first assignment, there's five points that has to do with naming conventions. I take off one point for every mistake. It's five points given to you for free. I guarantee, like I said, 40% of you are going to lose at least two of those five points. Two hands at the exact same time. Let's go with the one that's closer. A singular parent table. In other words, you take the parent to parent's table name in singular format, underscore the name of their primary key. You'll see it when I do it on the board. But that's the rules. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and actually convert this from a logical to a physical. Now, what's the steps between logical and physical? Is you take this and you represent it with, you do two things to it. Number one, you normalize all the names of the fields to follow the naming conventions. Now, that having been said, not everybody follows the same naming conventions. Therefore, whenever you get hired somewhere, they're going to tell you these are your naming conventions. And what do you say at that point? Got it. You don't even bother to argue about what the naming conventions because they probably chose those for a reason. And you're probably not informed enough to know what the reason was. Step number two. We also assign it data types. Because right now, we don't know what any of this is. And if you guys had the same lecture with Howard yesterday as he was giving today, he was talking about picking data types for your variables and your properties, right? This is perfect timing. You swear him and I are actually communicating. <laughs> you laugh. We've actually compared notes about what we're covering when in the term. So I'm going to take this, convert it. Now, there's a few other rules that come into effect. And I'm going to be using a few different colors on this to put asides, like little notes on the side to explain what the stuff is. And we're also going to get rid of a few 
little quirk that survived its way through the normalization process that once you get to this point, you realize some of this is really, really stupid, and why am I doing this? And that's normal. So I'm going to go from logical to physical, and I'm going to fix it as I go. Now, the first table I'm going to do is the easy one. I'm going to do supplier. And I'm writing uppercase. It's because my lowercase handwriting really sucks. Remember, I said it's called suppliers. Ah, z, pass. No, I'm positive. So, based on the rules, what's the primary key called? ID. And here I called it name, which is fine. One of the other things you tend to try to do when you go from logical to physical is you try to normalize some other fields that are used commonly. For example, if you look at supplier and you look at products, do you really see much of a difference in what's in there? Not, not essentially the exact same thing, right? Except one uses the word name, one's using the word description. When you go to do the physical design, this is one of the ones where the framework guys are still arguing, right? They've all agreed about what the primary key should be called and everything else. This is known as a descriptor field. As in, what is the name, the description of the object you're looking at? Not as in, but it's, it's like if I looked at you and said, what's your name? That's your descriptor. Not that I'll remember it for the most part, but that what is your descriptor. So in the end, as you're going from the logical to the physical, you want to try to normalize this kind of stuff. Um, Cake PHP and um, Rails and Laravel all agree. So I'm going to go with that one. And they say name. So name. All right. So. Now, we know that our ID is the primary key. So I'm going to put a PK over here. Yeah. No, ID. Just the word ID. And this is where it's a little hard to explain to you guys because you don't have the programming background that when I used to use this explanation with other students, they'd have is when you create a function in Java, you can create a single function that calls every reference table. Like these are reference tables. You can write a single function in Java that pulls back from every reference table. And all you need to do is pass in the name of the table and it automatically knows what the fields are because you followed the same rules. So if, and on the other hand, if you did you know, supplier underscore ID or ID suppliers or whatever, You'd have to give it a parameter for what the primary key name is. Then you have to give the parameter of what the description field is. Suddenly you're adding three parameters. That's 60% of the SQL statement. Therefore, you might as well just write the SQL statement for each table independently. You're defeating the point of code reuse. So our ID is here, and we have a name. Now I'm going to use green for my data types. The ID is going to be a big serial. Now, big serial, if you remember my lecture from last week when I was rushing through this at this point, is a big serial is a special data type. It's known as a meta type. It's a data type that maps out to a real data type plus some extra functionality thrown on for giggles. In other words, the big serial is actually a big int or an integer 8. Those are the same data type. They just have two names for the same thing. And it throws on an auto increment functionality to it. So that's what big serial does. The other one that's the worst looking bracket known to man. We have name, 
var cards, the same thing as character varying. It's just the short form. Uh, for example, Microsoft SQL Server only has var card. It doesn't have character varying. Each of the servers support the same kind of data types. They just use different names for the same thing, except unless you're Oracle, because then you do something stupid like call it varcar2. But even though there's no varcar1, because varcar1 is reserved for future use, then people wonder why Oracle's dying. That is how many characters it's allowed to be. And I also said it was going to be not null. Now, because it's a primary key here, you don't need to say it's not null because the primary key is always not null. By default, it is always going to be not null. Just like that. That's our first table. Good enough. Now we're going to deal with the orders table. like such. Now, we have a compound key currently in here. And compound keys are bad. Okay? Oh, really? There. Crap. I usually write caps because I write bigger when I write caps. It's just orders. So we want to get rid of this compound key because realistically compound keys are bad. They're hard to work with. So you end up creating a synthetic key. And when you think about it, all said and done, we don't need the supplier number to be part of the primary key. It was just leftovers from the normalization process. When we, after you, feed, you know, when I was talking about the design process yesterday, you go back, you look at it again, and go, frick, what was I thinking? That's what's going to happen now, is we're having a what the hell was I thinking moment. So in orders, we're going to include our ID, because that's what you call your primary key. And it's going to be, okay, it is going to be a surrogate key, also known as a synthetic key. And I'm going to put an aside here in just a moment. like this. Now I'm going to put my little aside note here. The reason why this isn't that important, what we call it, other than we have to follow the rules, is even though the ID here really is invoice number, the application can change the label on the form. You look at the form and it says invoice number, really that's probably ID. You're just changing the label so that it makes sense to the person sitting behind the desk, you know, punching in orders. However, it's a synthetic key or a surrogate key, and it has no business meaning, really. And the name is irrelevant because, like anything else, you can change the name of things. The next one we have is supplier number. Now, there it's called supplier number. Now, our primary key here is called ID. The table is called suppliers. So this will be called supplier ID. Thus, it's the ID of a supplier. And where do we find the supplier? In the suppliers table. Now this is where things get a little weird. It's going to be a big int or an int 8. They're the same thing. Now, the reason it's a big int 
is because behind the big serial, the primitive data type is a big int. When it's a foreign key, you don't want this number to keep going up on its own. You want it to stay static so it maps out to what's happening over here. Yes? Yes. Does not. Big serial auto increments because big serial is a big int that knows how to count. Now, remember when I was talking about the data types last week and I talked about times and dates? And you should always use the entirety of it instead of just using the date. You can include the date and the time. Yes? No, as part of the design process, imagine we looked at this diagram, we took a break, went, had a beer, had some supper, came back and realized we screwed up. Okay. It's part of the iterative process. Hey, there's no compound keys because you try to avoid them as much as you can. No, it's just a foreign key. Primary keys are never null. So it's, you don't need to because it's by default. It's impossible to have a nullable primary key. So if ever you see that question on an exam, which you might. Primary keys can never be null. No. Uh, actually, we, I put it not null over there, so yes, we should put it not null here. We decided it was not null because there should always be a date on it. Now, past this, and that's something you can't see normally on this diagram, is you can set the default value for this. So I'll put it as an aside here. For the order date, you can set the default to now. And that's a function that's in every database server, or most of them anyways, except for Oracle. Oracle does something different, but it's the same idea. It's called now, and it automatically injects the current timestamp. So year, month, day, hour, minutes, seconds, and depending on the server, milliseconds, microseconds of precision. OK, now we have our orders. We have our suppliers. I'm going to put the products down over here. And this is where we start having a problem a little bit with our, our joy of joys. Because in here, if you remember what the data looked like originally, this was alphanumeric. And they were all four-digit codes. So we're going to, based on the data that we had originally, this will become a var car. I'll make it a five to give myself some room. All right, so that's my products table, because here we decide description could be null. We've remapped description to be equal to name, and the skew became ID. In this case, because the data originally was alphanumeric, we're going to keep it alphanumeric. 
because we should be careful when we do this. Honestly, if it was just me, doing it just for me, I'd have a big serial here and have the SKU as a separate field with a unique index on it. That is not something that I've taught yet. So unique index is not something I've taught. I don't teach that for a couple of weeks, four weeks. Um, but theoretically, you could actually make it behave like the rest if you wanted to. But because we determined in the end that the SKU really was unique, there's basically a blue, uh, SKUs are unique throughout the world. You could go to Germany and bananas are still code 0411. I mean 4011 is the code for bananas, even in Germany. It's actually a worldwide code that's been accepted. Yeah, but it'll still say from Chile, but it's still 04011. Regardless where you go in the world, the SKUs for produce is the same. Just so you know. And actually a lot of the dairy, and not the dairy, but the, the uh, bakery codes are pretty much the same. Like you go buy panini rolls at Loblaws and panini rolls at Walmart, they're going to have the same code for the same paninis. It's just an accepted code that somebody out there is a body that actually controls these, believe it or not. And the body aside, code for panini is whatever the frig it is, 3052 or something. Yeah. It depends on the server, and it depends how you initialize it. For example, Postgres defaults to UTF-8. UTF-8 accepts Unicode, the, the base set. It'll, UTF-8 can handle most alphabets. <coughs> it used to default something called SQL ASCII, which would be uh, the first 127 characters, the first 127 letter codes, including stupid things like spaces and tabs, and everything else was stored in binary format. So if you put in things that I didn't recognize, it would go in like that. Now, for naming conventions, and you're dealing with other languages, as a rule of thumb, you probably want to uh, avoid accents. Stuff like that. Why? Portability. Just assume that you can't use any special characters. It's going to make life easier. Long run. You, you can do it. I've seen a, a database that's in Japanese, and they're actually using Japanese characters as the table names. Is it easy to understand? Probably if I could read Japanese. Uh, but is it easy to deal, deal with an SQL statement where you go, select kanji, comma, kanji from kanji, where kanji equal to like five? Even in Japan, they do their databases in English usually. Yes, but realistically, that's actually going to be slower than using the real numbers. Yes. Uh, because the hexadecimal decimal val, depending on the server, um, some of them store an extra object in here called an OID, object ID, and usually it's a 32 character hex number. So you can go five or a 32 character hex code. So it's not worth it. Now I'm going to do the last one here, order lines. I'm writing uppercase again. Bruh. Now, as we said earlier, we're trying to get rid of compound keys because they're not a good thing. So right now in here we discovered as part of our process that the supplier didn't need to be part of the primary key here which means it doesn't even need to come down here anymore when we come over here and I'll explain to you guys why in a minute. However the invoice number needs to come down but now the invoice number can't behave as a primary key because there's not enough information there. So what do we do? We give it a surrogate key. And what does our surrogate key look like? It 
Somebody see a pattern here? It's all the same. Now we're going to need our order ID. And since that's a biggest serial, this will be a, a big int. We also need our product ID. Which is also, in this case, it's a varchar 5. You have to make sure the data types are compatible with each other. And we decided that this was a foreign key. It's a foreign key. That is. Not null. And we also had quantity. Which we're going to assume we don't do partial values. It's an integer. And I also didn't make the quantity mandatory. Like that. like such and this is how our physical ends up looking and now that can be done in toad and click 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 Yes. Because that we did, we decided not to. There's no reason we couldn't. Unrealistically, we could go at the logical level and say, you know, I don't think we need that. And then we start implementing it in the database, and then we have like 26 SKUs with no descriptions. It's all useless. Then you realize, well, darn. And then you could just force, you could change the rule to not null. You name, you give a value to all the null ones and then you give, make it not null. That's part of the iterative design process. As you just asked, you go, is there a reason why it's not null? No, there's no reason. We just decided that's what it was. Now, is that the right choice? Who knows? But we could make it not null if we wanted to. It's going to cause no grief and it's actually going to force proper integrity. And that's that.